Hello, everybody. I'm glad you got here on these slick roads. Welcome to uh, the second in our series on the beauty of the brain. Um, I'm excited to see all of you here. And uh, we can begin now that Melanie Hoyle and Mary Hall have arrived. I was waiting for them, but yay. All right, all right, ladies. All right, we're ready to begin. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed as much as I did last last year's last week's lecture. I need to ask you to turn off your cell phones if you've forgotten to do so thus far, um, because if you've forgotten to turn it off, that's when it'll ring. That's the way these things work, right? I want to remind you that we have actually five separate lecturers in this series, and in the fifth um, evening of the series, I believe that. Dean Comer is going to be coming back to talk to us a little bit about at the beginning of the um, hour, and then we'll be having a panel discussion with all of the lecturers. Once again tonight, I believe that all of the lecturers are here, and that's what really makes it a, an excellent series, makes it hang together as a series, because I think you'll find reflections by each of them on the lectures that he or she has heard before. So I'm really excited about the series. Uh, tonight, I have a chance to introduce Professor Richard Bridges. Uh, Professor Bridges and I have just met a couple of weeks ago in connection with this series, so that's a real joy for me. Professor Bridges came to the university in 1993 as an associate professor, so he's been here for about 18 years, I guess. Um, he is very, very active in the neuroscience community in Montana. He currently serves as a board chairman of the Montana Neuroscience Institute. He was a founding member of the Montana Bioscience Alliances and Montana Neuroscience Institute. And he became the chair of what was, I think, a reorganized department um, in uh, 2008, became the chair of the Department of Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences here at UM. You can read a little bit of detail about his research on your, on your uh, program, so I won't go into that. Just to point out that something that's very different between what these scientists experience on their side of campus and what we humanists experience on our side of campus. I'm not going to talk about money. <laughs> no, no, I won't. Um, no, no is that, <laughs> well, not much, anyway, is that they and their students, their graduate students and their under, undergraduate students all work together on a daily basis in lab experiments. And Chris Comer mentioned to us uh, the contributions that his own postdocs had made to his presentation last week and to his research. Um, it, you'll see on your, uh, on your program that um, there's quite the impressive focus in the Bridges Laboratory, and I'm hoping, hoping that by the end of tonight, we will all know what an excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate is. Um, I'm counting on it myself. Um, and I think that it must be really, really an exciting thing for graduate and undergraduate students to be able to hone their research skills um, in the labs of these wonderful, wonderful scientists of ours. I did want to mention another thing in which Professor Bridges is involved, and that is the, United, uh, the University of Montana, Mon Monta Missoula, County Public Schools Fusion Research Seminar. And this is a ground up um, process in which the Montana Public Schools um, teachers, the Missoula Public Schools teachers, wanted to be able to work with the University of Montana scientists along with some of the excellent high school teachers we have in the, uh, and students that we have in the sciences. Are any of our teachers here from the Montana, uh, Missoula County Public Schools? Richard says they've all heard all of this before, but they have an ongoing seminar. It's been going on for about a year now, and Richard tells me that actually every time they have a seminar, they have about 100 students who show up to do these seminars, and they have their sixth one coming up tomorrow, I believe, uh, and are expecting a great turnout. So I think that's one of the things that everybody should know about, that these very busy scientists who are very productive in their own disciplines are also giving their time and their energy and their expertise to our high school students uh, and working with the high school teachers in the Missoula County Public Schools. So I think with uh, no further ado, I will just introduce to you Richard Bridges. Come on over, Richard, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you, Linda. I I don't want the word to get out, but the high school students, we give them pizza after the talk, but could create a, a bit of a stir here. 
Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out, and particularly the Alumni Association for giving me the opportunity to talk. And, and a special thanks to Chris Comer, who spoke last week um, in organizing this talk. I think it's, it's, it's a really cool thing to participate in. We chose the, um, the title of the beauty of the brain for a number of reasons. Obviously, the long-range connection of the brain being able to interpret and, and, and have its own definition of beauty. But I also hope you, you see some actual beauty in the, the elegance of the brain, whether it's in its structure or in its function. And, and as Linda also mentioned, one of our goals as instructors, whether we're teaching a course or supervising an undergraduate or a graduate student in our lab, is to kind of try and impart our vision of where we find that beauty. And I think in this series of lectures, you'll find each of the different faculty participating find a different perspective or a different type of beauty within either the structure or the function or the operation of the brain. In my instance, that, um, that level is, is really at the chemical level. Um, Chris talked a lot about systems function and the big picture of the brain. And I want to take us way, way, way far down to look at actually how two different neurons talk to one another and the consequences of those now that we understand can rebuild back up and, and try to explain some of those more complex functions like memory. Um, before I really get started, though, I also, let's see, my, I'm not advancing. Okay, I also, uh, Linda mentioned last week about the Spectrum uh, uh, Science Project, the Science Exploratorium that's on campus. And they're featuring, um, their focus this, this past several months has been on the brain. And I would really encourage um, any of you to have your kids or grandkids, if they get a chance to go participate in, in some of their experiential learning. Um, it's not quite as creative the picture as, as the dolly, but I consider it one of my most creative endeavors because this is actually my son. Who, who's one of the uh, science helpers at, at the uh, at Spectrum. So definitely take advantage of that. So as Chris mentioned, there are a number of different ways to look at the brain. And, and the way that clinicians and scientists actually image the brain have, have dramatically really improved in the, last, in the last several years. So you can look at MRI and look at the structure of the brain. Most of us are familiar with what these MRIs would look like. But now the technology allows us to build three-dimensional reconstructions of these and go in. And, and in this case, there's, it's hard to see, but this was um, done to find a small tumor that's actually right here. And that could then be used in real time in the surgical suite to guide, guide the surgery. Um, not only can we image structure now, but we can also image function. So Chris alluded to last week a PET scan. And a PET scan is essentially a way of um, John, can we bring the lights down just, just a bit? It's a way of looking at brain function. And essentially, you can use a PET ligand. You inject a small, very, very small tracer amount into the brain. And when you image it, the areas of the brain that were active during whatever the person was doing light up. So in this instance, the area of the brain that, that does visual processing is, is located right here. And when the eyes are closed, this area isn't very active. Here we see how this activity changes in real time in a patient as they're opening their eyes, and then if they look at a more complex picture. So there are ways to actually vis visualize the brain working in real time. And if we have a little bit of time near the end of the lecture, I'll come back and talk about a pet project that's, that's starting in my lab. But both the, the pictures I showed you of structure and of function a really big systems level picture. And I'm interested in, and the people in my lab are interested in what's happening at a lower level. So we can start to look at the cells of the neuron. This is actually the cells here in a rat brain. And this is part of a structure that we'll talk about quite a bit of tonight called the hippocampus. And, and there are a lot of the, the properties that are established by these cells, how they're organized, how they communicate, that dictate higher function. But I want to go down a level even lower than this and go down to the level of the synapse. So how neurons actually process the signal and talk to one another. And if you remember, this is one of the pictures that Chris showed last week. 
One might even think we talked about what we were going to, to say, but it turns out it was just a coincidence. We both found the same picture in one of the references we had left for you in the, in the library. So if we look at this as a generic neuron, the signaling that takes place within this neuron, down this long cable or down this long axon, is electrical. It's conducted down this in a wave of ions that go in and out of the cell membrane. So the conduction down the neuron is electrical, and when it gets all the way down here to the tip, and we blow up this tip, one neuron passes its signal to the next chemically. So we have two different types of communication going on. One is the electrical conduction down the axon, and the other is passing that signal from one neuron to the next. And this is what I am really interested in. As that signal comes down, these vesicles that hold the molecules, the signaling molecules called neurotransmitters, are released into the cleft. And to give you an idea of, of sort of what that might look like, you'll be able to see in this image, we'll zoom in, and there you can actually see the signals, and this is obviously an artist's rendition, going down. Now we'll zoom in on an axon, and those are the ions moving back and forth, and you can see they move in a wave-like manner. And that's what's sending that signal down that axon as these ions move in and out. Now, we'll follow one of those all the way down to the terminal. And here are those synaptic vesicles that are filled with a chemical. They come down here and release. The chemical comes across and it'll activate these receptors on the next neuron in, in its line. And if that signal is big enough, that neuron fires and passes the signal all down, down the network. And essentially, all of neur neuronal communication is based on when that signal gets passed, does that next cell in the circuit, does it fire or not fire? It's almost a binary system, very similar to, to a computer. Okay. So whether or not you get inhibitory signals or excitatory signals, they all add up. And if that cell is excited enough, it will fire and the signal goes on down the communication chain. So what I am interested in and what most of the work in my laboratory studies is how the signaling process takes place. So when the molecule is released, how does it activate these receptors? How is the signaling molecule, how is its concentration controlled so the right amount is in the right place? The other take home lesson to remember when you see this system and, and Chris also mentioned this last week, is you have to realize this communication is taking place outside of the cell. So the most exquisite type of function and communication in the brain is taking place in an environment that is exposed to everything else that can enter or come in or out of the brain. So toxins, drugs, it's, it's very easy to see why drugs have side effects. If drugs are meant to come in and interact with this receptor, all the other receptors are accessible to them. All those other proteins that are involved in signaling. So it's one of the challenges in, in terms of drug design for the central nervous system that, that is a big obstacle to overcome. How, how do you maintain the specificity of action when everything is taking place in the ex, essentially the extracellular environment of the CNS? So when we talk about signaling molecules, we call them neurotransmitters because they are transmitting the signal. And there are about 40, or about 40 different types of transmitters that range everything from small peptides to, to hormones could be considered neurotransmitters to some very basic small signaling molecules. And these are some of the major players that are involved in the different types of signaling. And I'm sure you've heard of some of them. Um, acetylcholine, that's the signaling molecule primarily that communicates between neurons and muscles. Um, serotonin. This is uh, a well-known neurotransmitter, most likely because of its, its site of action for SSRIs, for serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're used to treat depression. Uh, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's involved in a number of systems, including movement. And it's this transmitter that is lost in Parkinson's disease. And two of the really most important players in the day-to-day -day signaling of the nervous system are GABA, GABA aminobutyric acid, and glutamate. So GABA is the primary inhibitory transmitter. It tends to calm and slow neurons down, while glutamate excites them. 
So GABA is the site of action of drugs like benzodiazepines and barbiturates that are CNS depressants. They make the system work even better and calm it down. That's why this is the site also of anesthetics. Glutamate, which is really the focus of the work in my group, is an excitatory transmitter, and it works by exciting the system. And the more glutamate gets on a cell, the more it's excited, and the closer it gets to threshold where it will hit an action potential and send that signal down to the next neuron. So I'm very interested in how this molecule activates neurons, how it's regulated, what its role is in different disease processes and normal physiological mechanisms. So if we look at one of those generic synapses and now sort of tailor it to glutamate, here we have that terminal. Our signal is coming down the axon here. And when it reaches this, the glutamate molecules, which are the small green molecules, are released into the synaptic cleft, as we saw in the movie. They can come and they essentially diffuse across this, this cleft. And in the instance of glutamate, they can activate a number of different types of receptors, different flavors of receptors that are all a little bit different from one another. If you look in the literature, um, for example, GABA receptors. They call them GABA-A receptors or GABA-B receptors. People got really creative when they, when they labeled dopamine receptors. They call them D1, D2, D3. <laughs> what I think is really cool, and I got into the field quite early on, is the receptors that glutamate work on are actually named after the drugs that were used to discover the receptor. So it's, it's kind of a nice tribute to the medicinal chemists and the pharmacologists. So these are called the AMPA receptor for a chemical whose name is too long to remember, NMDA for N-methyl diaspartate, canic acid. So these drugs will come in and activate only one type of receptor while glutamate activates them all. A good way to think of it is glutamate is the skeleton key. You can go down the hallway and open every door with it. But these drugs are individual molecules that will only activate one type of receptor at a time. So you can use it to study what that receptor does. And in fact, that's really the, the gist of what my work is, is aimed at trying to develop those types of molecules that we can use to study all the different types of proteins that glutamate bind to. So glutamate activates these receptors, and there has to be a way to get rid of glutamate. And these are the molecules that I've been studying most recently, and these are the glutamate transporters. So they essentially suck that glutamate out of this cleft so they can no longer activate the receptors and recycle the neurotransmitter. Okay. So if we get a look at what some of those components look like, this is just sort of my rendition of it. These are what the synaptic vesicles look like. Here you can see an electron micrograph. And if you look very carefully here, you can actually see one of the synaptic vesicles that's fused. There's actually a gap here where it has already dumped its, its uh, neurotransmitter into the cleft. And by doing very, very careful electron microscopy and three-dimensional modeling of it, you can see how elegant these vesicles are. They're all lined up, ready for a signal to come down that axon and be released. Once it's released, the neurotransmitter is going to activate those receptors. And here is a model. Here's our closest rendition of what we think those receptors really look like. There are a couple of different proteins that are all organized around a central channel. There's a place where the neurotransmitter binds. And when that neurotransmitter binds, it opens that channel. Ions go through. And you can look right down that channel here. Ions go through and pass that now electrical signal into the cell and either excite it to where if it gets excited to threshold, it fires the signal down to the next neuron. Or they could put ions in that inhibit it and, and, make, and make it harder for that neuron to fire. Okay. If we look at that other component to terminate the signal, we have neurotransmitter transporters. And this is actually a crystallization of what one of those proteins look like. And this huge structure, this protein, is designed to just transport the small molecule that's right here. Here's a blow up of it. Okay. And this really is where much of the work in my lab and, and a number of labs in the center is focused. In fact, these models were generated partly by Greg Leary, who's, who's one of the graduate students and now a research fellow in the lab. It's sitting in the back. So these are what the components look like. How do they all fit together? If we take and just look at another movie, 
This is of synaptic transmission, and you'll actually be able to see a little more focus on chemical transmission. Also, Chris picked the music for this. I don't know where it comes from, but. So here's the signal moving down the axon. So this is an Irish neuron. Okay, so the signal is coming down to our terminal and it's gonna go in and look inside the terminal and you'll actually be, see, be able to see the vesicle. So here are the vesicles with the neurotransmitters in them. And they're gonna fuse and release the neurotransmitter in the outside. Now it's binding to a receptor and opening up that ion channel. There go the golf ball ions. And then the neurotransmitter gets sucked back up into the transporter that terminates the signal. And all this is happening millions of times per second. And that, that process is really the basis of how neurons talk to one another. Okay? Any questions? Does this seem, <laughs> seem to make sense? Go ahead. So the question is, where are the transporters? They can actually be anywhere. They can be downstream or upstream. And in fact, most often, they're on the glial cells that surround the synapse. So they're ideally positioned to suck that transmitter away very, very quickly. And in, near the end of the lecture, I'll show you what happens if they don't work properly. It's, it's, it's a bad thing, OK? Where do dendrites do this? So dendrites are, if I go back to my model here, dendrites are these types of connections where this postsynaptic area is. And essentially, dendrites are like antenna. They just increase the surface area for the incoming axons and the terminals to meet with. So essentially, you increase your surface area and you increase the number of, of places where connections can form. Okay. So. Um, one of the things that we're very interested in, and what I'm going to be spending most of tonight talking to you about, is one flavor of these receptors, and that's the NMDA receptor. Okay. Now, one way to study these receptors, and this gets back to some of the, the work um, that I was involved in at, at UC Irvine before I moved here, was to design and make a drug that would bind to these receptors and be radioactive. And then you could actually trace where it goes on a piece of brain tissue. And when you do this, you get an image like this. And this is an image of a rat brain. And where the drug is binding is where the NMDA receptors are. And, and where the drug is binding to the highest degree is found in red and the next yellow. And where, the, where it's blue and black, there's no binding. And two things jump out at you. First of all, all the binding you have right in this structure here and all the binding you have in this outer layer. Now, this outer layer is the cortex of the brain where it's thought most of the higher cognitive processing goes on. Okay? And this area of the brain is called the hippocampus. If you happen to listen to NPR um, yesterday morning, there was a great series of, of talks on the importance of the hippocampus and its role in learning and memory. Now, neurologists knew for a long time that this area was important in learning and memory because if it's damaged, if it's damaged in a stroke or damaged in some type of trauma, people lose the ability to form memories. Okay. Now, I just want to step aside for a second and say, as we go through and I talk about some of the discoveries and some of this data, a lot of which happened and was done in labs other than, other than mine, try and, and identify or think about the themes that connect them. In retrospect, the connections look very obvious, okay? But at the time, they weren't quite as clear. But, okay, we have a part of the brain that is involved in memory. Oh, and we have receptors that are found in the highest density in those areas. And in patients, for example, with some types of Alzheimer's disease, this area of the brain is damaged and they can't form memories. It starts to lay sort of those threads that connect into the fact that the NMDA receptor may play a role in memory. Okay? And to show you that, I mean, that's a rat brain, but this is actually what that same structure, this C-type structure, looks like in a human brain. And this, these were the very first images. They were done by Dan Monahan and Jim Geddes. 
who sat at the desk right across from me at Irvine, that they were able to do this localization of these receptors in the human brain, showing they were very similar to the rat model. Now, for as much as I enjoy doing chemistry and neurochemistry and studying that, the bottom line is you really can't study neuronal function unless you can follow their activity electrically. So, like it or not, I've got to work with neurophysiologists. They're a real cranky group. <laughs> but they're very, very talented people. And this is an example. Here, here are hippocampal neurons. And they get very, very good at inserting electrodes down and actually poking into these cells so they can listen in to their cellular communication. Okay. Now, the series of experiments I'm going to talk about and what's happened has really happened over about the last 25 years. It, it's just beginning to reach the textbooks now, but, but it's, it's some of the most fascinating neuroscience that's been done at the molecular level in understanding how neurons talk to one another. And investigators like Tim Bliss, Gary Lynch, Roger Nickel, um, you will see them in, 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 the, in the newspapers, I bet, within the next three or four years, because this is definitely Nobel Prize winning breakthrough type of work. And I'm going to try and talk you through the experiments that they carried out. So, OK, so here we have three neurons in a circuit, all right? And I'm going to go in and, and use one of those electrodes, electrically stimulate this neuron. What's going to happen? It's going to release the neurotransmitter. And if I record or listen to this neuron, I'll see a signal. OK. All right. If I do this in the same circuit and I stimulate this neuron, I get the release of about the same amount of transmitter and the same signal. Very reproducible. And this is the normal type of synaptic communication that would go on in everyday function. Okay, now, here's the cool experiment. So we start off, we stimulate one neuron, we release transmitter, and we see a signal. The breakthrough experiment, stimulating a bunch of neurons. We saw more transmitter released, and we see a bigger signal. Well, OK, that's cool, but that's really not going to, I mean, it probably doesn't surprise you that we have a bigger signal going in and a bigger signal coming out, OK? So when we, multi when we activate a number of receptors, we get a bigger response. Here's what was cool. They went back into this circuit. They simulated a single neuron, got the small release, and got a bigger signal than they started with. OK? So this response is different from that, even though the same signal came in. OK? So this cell is more sensitive. Now, it's a pretty simple observation. I mean, OK, this signal is bigger than that. What are the connotations? What goes with that? Well, if you think about what really happened, this neuron physically changed, biochemically changed in response to his experience. What do we call that? We call that learning. That cell has changed in response to its input. Okay. I mean, this, this, it, it's a very simple observation, a simple effect with huge consequences. Now, how do we know the NMDA receptor was involved in this? This process is technically called long-term potentiation because the signal, this signal, is potentiated over that signal. And it lasts for days and it lasts for weeks. How do we know NMDA receptors are involved? OK, now the biochemists and the med chemists come back into the equation. So we developed drugs that would block the NMDA receptor. So we could infuse them at the same time the signaling was taking place and block that glutamate from activating receptors. And when we did that, lo and behold, we were back to normal. So this showed that this potentiation, this cellular model, this really a cellular model of learning, could be blocked simply by, by, by preventing one single type of receptor from participating in the signaling process. And that's a pretty, pretty amazing thing. OK, now, it's a big stretch. I mean, if you meet the very fundamental processes in a dish and, and a, a neuroscientist will, will say, hypothetically, 
The simplest model of learning is the cell just changes its chemical properties in response to some experience. And actually, that definition was made long before anyone actually observed LTP. They knew that's what they had to see. So that's why they realized when they did see it, it was very significant. But how does that translate to memory? Okay. Now, this is a slide. And unfortunately, he's, this is a, a buddy of mine. His name's Pat Keslak. And he has a rat sitting in a, in a radial maze. It's a little dark to see in this image. But it's, it's, it almost looks like a star pattern of eight arms. And we train the rat. We put him in it. And we, we might put a treat at the end of each arm. And the, the mouse of the rat learns very quickly to go out and get that treat, come back, and never go down that arm again. He'll go down the next one. He'll go down the next one. He'll go down the next one, not repeating itself, because he learns how to solve the maze very efficiently. You can also put a treat in every other arm. And after the rat has practiced and learned how to do this, he can solve the maze very quickly. And to give you an idea of what, what that looks like, You'll see in this movie where you see the red dots on the maze, there's a treat that hasn't been eaten. And when the mouse eats it, it turns yellow. Okay? And they're going to drop the mouse into this radial arm maze. He's practiced. He's learned how to solve it. And he's going to orient himself. He's going to go down the wrong arm. Okay? But now he knows where he is. And watch, watch how he solves this maze. OK, he's figured out where he is. OK, here he goes. Finds a treat. He'll sit and eat it for a second. There are places I remember all my life. Oh, some have changed. There you got that one. Forever Munches on it. Right down there. Skipping all these intermediate ones because he knows there's no treat there. All these places have their moments with lovers and friends. I still can recall. I know I'll often stop and think about them. Um, about three days of training, a couple, of, uh, maybe an hour a day, and then they'll get it. So we solved it in a minute and 40 seconds. Okay, now. The amazing experiment, that, and people have been studying this type of memory and this type of behavior that they would call spatial memory for a long time. And they study different ways it's encoded. But the breakthrough experiment was when they did this same experiment and they pre-treated the animal with the drugs that block the NMDA receptor. While he was learning it, the rat never learned how to solve the maze. Every time you put them in it, it was like the very first time. So now we had that model that was explained at the cellular level in a dish. And the receptor systems involved translated all the way up to human behavior, okay, or at least to rat behavior. But it works very, very similar in the fact that the NMDA receptors are also in the area of the brain that's responsible for learning. And they're in the area of the brain that, are, that is damaged in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, where you lose the ability to form memories. Okay. So the obvious question everybody was interested in, particularly my students, was, is there a way to make this system work better? And in fact, <clears throat> there is. And there are a number of drugs you can use to activate this system. In fact, you can artificially create mice that have more of these receptors. And they solve the night mazes faster. They're smarter rats. Okay. Now, that's, that's a really cool thing. And it could have some really good applications. I mean, my first thought is, what about patients that are having, having difficulties with memory? Is there a way to take advantage of this system to boost their memory? My students are wondering, is there a pill I can take before while I study <laughs> for your exam and make myself do better? And, and right now, there is, I think, a, well, in the past, it, it might have been a little harder to interpret. There's some very high quality, very cool research going on on cognitive enhancers, ways to make these systems that can now be characterized biochemically more efficient. Okay. In the instance of glutamate, though, there's a catch. Because right away, if you think, let's try and make these systems work better, 
<clears throat> there's an expression, a good colleague, Chuck Thompson of mine, who's a chemist, who helps make some of the compounds that, that I'll be talking about. He says, in science, whenever you think you have the upper hand, it usually reaches up and slaps you in the face. Okay? And the same thing is true with this. So at the same time, all of this research was going on in showing that glutamate was a neurotransmitter. A couple of other groups were putting glutamate directly onto neurons, and it was killing them. So in this slide, and this is actually work, work done in my group, the neurons are these black cells with nice white halos around them. That means they're very functional, they're alive, they're very healthy. And the kind of smaller, grayer cells in the background, those are actually the glial cells that are support cells that they're growing on top of. So what I did was take another glutamate-like molecule, an NMD, a, a molecule that would activate NMDA receptors. I put it on, or the Colin Willis, who was a student in my lab at the time, put it on these cells, put it on for just five minutes, and then took it away and put the cells back in their normal, healthy media. And over a 24-hour period, those halos disappear. You really end up with just garbage left. And if you take the same, the same dish and stain it with what's called a vital dye, a dye that only goes in to cells that are dying, here's the pattern. All those, and these are the same neurons. Look, there's one, two, three. That's those one, two, three neurons. I mean, these, these cells have died, OK? So how is glutamate working? What, what, what's, what's happening? Why is, in these one series of experiments, is an important, signal, an important signaling molecule? It's involved in higher cognitive processes by learning and memory, yet this group is saying, hey, glutamate's actually a neurotoxin. Well, you can make a lot of arguments that <clears throat> when you take a, a, a neurons out of, a, out of a fetal rat brain and you grow them in the dish, you can grow them and study them, but they, maybe they aren't really representative of brains in, 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 in vivo, in a person's head. They're much more vulnerable to injury. You know, maybe this has no relevance at all. In fact, I was at meetings where people would stand up and go, this is irrelevant. I mean, if I hit, hit the neurons with a hammer, they're going to die too. I mean, what difference does it make? So if we go back to, to our image here, so here in this area of the brain, OK, that's the hippocampus. We have lots and lots of NMDA receptors. What if we put an NMDA agonist right into that part of the brain? What would it do to the brain cells? And when we do those experiments, we get an image like this. So this is the hippocampus. It's in black and white now. But here are live, healthy cells. And then this is the C shape. And the cells up here are missing. They're all dead. And here, actually, you can see the needle track of where we injected the neurotoxin that activates NMDA receptors, or we believe is activating NMDA receptors. It killed those neurons. Well, are the NMDA receptors involved? Back to our biochemistry. What if we co-inject our toxin with the drug that blocks the NMDA receptors? What happens? Those cells are spared. Here's our injection tract. We put in the same amount of toxin that we put in here, these cells didn't die. OK, we're one step closer. We've actually shown that the neurons in the brain, in their normal environment, okay, are vulnerable to this type of damage. In fact, because it was hitting and mimicking glutamate, which is an excitatory amino acid, the process re was referred to by John Olney as excitotoxicity. Essentially, the cells we are hypothesizing we're being excited to death. It might be a great way to go, but, but once you're dead, you're dead. OK? Now, this was presented, and it said, OK, maybe this is real. Skeptics, and we all play the role of skeptics in science, someone would stand up and go, yeah, but how relevant is, is this? How often does someone succumb to someone stake, taking a syringe and jabbing it in the back of their head and injecting a glutamate toxin in there? I mean, how relevant is it? OK. So we go back to our picture of where the NMDA receptors are. Another group, OK, made the very, very uh, actually it was a group of neurologists that were studying stroke, realized this same area of the brain is very vulnerable to stroke. And in fact, if we take a rat 
and we do some minor surgery on him and we clamp his carotid artery. So we cut off the circulation to the brain for just a few minutes and then let it go. And we look for the most vulnerable area of the brain. It's often the hippocampus that's damaged. And you know, the histology that we see looks an awful lot like those brains that they had injected those neurotoxins into. Okay, so this was work done in San Diego in, in Graham Fagg's lab. Here's that same C-shaped organelle. And look, those same cells are dead. There's no injection tract. This rat wasn't given a toxin. This rat was just given a stroke. And it killed those same cells. So what this is saying is you don't have to have excitotoxicity. You don't kill neurons just by injecting an exogenous drug. The glutamate that's present in the brain, during a stroke, the cells lose control of it. It overactivates those cells and kills them. What's the crux experiment? Block the NMDA receptors and ask were the cells protected. And when this work was done and these cells were protected, every pharmaceutical company in the world began studying NMDA receptors. Because if you could have a compound that you could treat this with and prevent those cells from dying, I mean, obviously, the, the boon to, uh, to health would be s amazing. Okay, But, OK, and this is, this, these are the types of issues we're wrestling with all the time. So if we have, to, just to go back and review for a second, in excitotoxicity, we have essentially the same thing we happened during learning and memory, only even more so. There's even a larger signal that comes in, and the glutamate concentrations get absolutely out of control. Okay? And it kills this neuron. If we put in the NMDA receptor blocker, we prevent the glutamate from getting to those receptors, and we spare the cell. Okay. But that leaves us with this problem. So from the first part of the lecture, if we enhance NMDA function, we can boost learning and memory. The downside is we increase the likelihood that activating those cells could cause brain injury. Okay? If you go to the other side, tip the scales the other way, if we block the NMDA receptors to protect brain cells from injury, you decrease the ability for these cells to participate in learning and memory, in normal cognitive function. And in fact, most of the drugs that have been tested, okay, while they will prevent that type of damage, the side effects, the, the um, psychomimetic side effects are so great that they could never be used prophylactically. You could never be on a regimen of just NMDA receptor blockers. Where some of the progress has started to take place is looking at more subtle drugs that that just manipulate the level of activity without totally shutting it off or totally overactivating it. And those are the drugs that seem to have some potential that are working their ways into the clinics. <clears throat> some drugs that just boost function a bit can be used as cognitive enhancers, and those that slow the process down just a little bit can be used as neuroprotective agents. Okay? But it's these types of balances that let you know really how, you know, amazingly well fine-tuned the central nervous system is. You have to have just the right amount of neurotransmitter released in just the right amount, a little more if you want it to induce a, a memory formation and change that cell. But if it goes overboard, you're in trouble. Okay? And in fact, what it really means is the very complex nature, the complex machinery, biochemical machinery, we have in place that allows us to do these higher cognitive processing, that allows us to do memory, to, to do lots of different higher cognitive processing of information, those are the same processes that make us more vulnerable to damage. And, and it, it appears as if you can't have one, to, one or the other. Everyone knows the more complex your computer is, the easier it is for it to crash. It's no different with the central nervous system. How are we doing on time? Any, any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I will. So, so the question is, 
Um, let me go to this picture. What really causes the tox toxicity? OK, so this is getting in a little more depth than I had planned, but I think you guys are ready for it. OK. So there has to be something different when you activate the NMDA receptor that's different from activating these other receptors. Because this, activating this receptor or this receptor doesn't induce that long-term potentiation. It still excites the cell. It's still used in normal communication. But it doesn't do the potentiation that NMDA receptors do. And the difference is that when the NMDA receptor is open, it allows the, the ion calcium to come through. And calcium is a very interesting ion. Not only does it carry a charge with it, so there's some electrical signaling with calcium, calcium can also activate a lot of different enzymes and proteins and, and um, other systems, signaling systems within the cell. So the calcium coming in actually does things in this postsynaptic cell that actually puts more of these receptors on the external surface. So it, the biochemical change was mediated by calcium. Okay, But if too much calcium comes in, those biochemical processes just go uncontrolled and they get out of hand. And that's what ends up killing the cell. So it's basically the same underlying mechanism, calcium coming in, that if just the right amount comes in, okay, it properly activates things. If too much calcium comes in, the systems get out of control and it leads to pathology. Okay. Now, I, want, I do have a couple minutes. And I just wanted to tell you sort of about a project that's in my lab that, that is very new. <clears throat> to give you an idea of where doing some of these basic studies can lead. Okay? So I had talked about glutamate as a neurotransmitter. It's released, activates these cells. If it overactivates these cells, it can kill them. And the systems that are present in this synapse to prevent that from happening are these transport proteins okay? that very effectively suck up this glutamate and keep its levels low so that that overactivation doesn't take place. One of the major focus areas of our group over in the School of Pharmacy in the neuroscience group are studying how these transporters work and designing molecules to activate them, to inhibit them, to really study their, their function. It's a very, very nice niche that, that we've developed that has turned out to be has paid off big time. So a lot of pharmacology departments, a lot of neuroscience has been focused on characterizing the receptors, because that's where the real business is. We ended up with sort of a ragtag group of investigators that were very interested in transporters. And we all, all kind of met here in Montana and recruited one another to work on these systems. Okay. Well, it turns out in the disease amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, so Lou Gehrig's disease, okay, one of the things that happens during the course of the disease is these transporters, particularly this transporter right here, doesn't work properly. So the glutamate slowly starts to build up and kill these neurons. And the neurons that are most susceptible to being damaged are motor neurons. And those are the, motor, those are the neurons that die in the disease, which is why, I mean, it's a tragic, tragic disease. Someone with ALS they lose all of their, slowly lose all of their motor function, yet their other cognitive function stays fine. And it's because the motor neurons are most susceptible to an imbalance in this system. Okay? And a lot of the work on ALS was done with a group we collaborate with at Johns Hopkins, a man, uh, scientist by the name of Jeff Rostein. Well, we were developing very, very potent inhibitors to bind to this transporter. And we got together and started collaborating with Jeff. And what we're trying to do is build molecules. And this is that transporter. And we can go in now computationally and design molecules and see how well they fit inside this transporter. And then we synthesize them. And the students in my lab characterize their activity. But we went one step further working with another professor in, in our department. His name is John Gerties. And he specializes not only in making those types of ligands, but attaching a tracer to them that you can see in a PET imager. Okay? 
So we thought, and we, I mean, this is very, very preliminary data. We think we have identified a drug that very, very potently inhibits the transporter. And so work in my group and by my students, people like Sarge Patel and Fred Roderick, we've tested our compound. Our lead compound here is in green. is one of the most potent inhibitors of this system that's ever been characterized. And studies by Greg Leary, who is sitting in the back, shows that once this molecule binds, it may stay stuck to this transporter for 20 minutes. Well, if you want a tracer, and just put in a small amount of radioactive tracer that could stick for a long time, it would be a great way to image these transporters. And John has now worked out the chemistry to synthesize these molecules. And our goal is if he can get them into the brain and they will stick to the receptors, we'll be able to build a three-dimensional model of where these transporters are in the brain in a living patient with just a tracer dose that four weeks later, we could look at it again. And we can follow the progression of ALS with the biomarker looking at the target of one of the proteins that actually degenerates in the disease. Okay. Now on one hand, that's really great for following the progress of the disease, but how does that help treat it? The reason that, that we're fun to do this project is not only because we could follow the progress of the disease, but if another group has a new therapeutic, you could test the therapeutic at the same time we were doing the imaging and say, even before it has any effect on, on general symptoms that are noticed, is it slowing the degeneration? Is it slowing what we can see with our tracer? Okay. Now, the reason I wanted to give you this example, one was to tell you about some of the cool research going on on campus, but also we didn't know we were working on an ALS project four years ago. We were just doing basic biochemistry on how these systems work. So the take home lesson I also want you to walk away with, and I think all the other researchers that are talking, is good science always leads to good places. We don't know where it necessarily is going to go when it's at this very basic level. But almost always there's some cool application that emerges from it. And right now, to get up on my soapbox, politically, we're seeing some real challenges to how science is funded, what the NIH is doing. I've heard some people stand up and say, here's a project. This sounds stupid. Obviously, the NIH is wasting money. Well, when you just read the title of that project, it doesn't make sense. I can guarantee you, when we were first studying this transporter, and we were studying it in a dish and looking at a weird toxin that would kill motor neurons that came from a bean in Bangladesh, Everyone would have thought, that's a waste of money. Okay. It wasn't. So basic science, this is the significance of basic science, is you never quite know where it's going to go. But if you're doing good work, okay, if you're collaborating and you share where that work goes and, and interact with the other scientists, it will almost always lead you to some place that's, that's really cool and is beneficial. Obviously, in the, in the work I talked about tonight, there were a lot of different groups involved, uh, particularly, I mean, my group on all the biochemistry, the synthetic uh, chemistry group over in, in, uh, in the School of Pharmacy, people like Nick Natale, John Gerties, uh, Chuck Thompson, the students in my lab like Sarge Patel, students like Greg Leary. Um, within the, they we're all located within the Department of Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences, but also in the Neuroscience Center, which includes faculty from not just pharmacy, but faculty from chemistry, faculty from biology, even faculty from mathematics participate in this research. Um, the Montana Neuroscience Institute is our collaborative effort with St. Patrick Hospital that provides the translational and the clinical expertise for these projects. And originally, the work I showed you on the um, learning and memory took place at the Alzheimer's Center, where I was a, a fellow uh, before I moved to Montana. Um, funding was provided by the NIH. Um, it was provided by um, the University of Montana Foundation um, to study some of these neurodegenerative diseases. Um, also, the Montana Board of Research and Commercialization. This is actually a department in uh, Montana's Department of Commerce, and they fund seed projects that have the potential to go on and generate products that could be commercialized. And they've been, I think, showed some long-range thinking in, in funding these projects. 
And the Packard Foundation and the P2 ALS program have funded that most recent work that I talked to you, talked to you about um, regarding our, our ALS project. And with that, I will finish and take questions. So, so to repeat the question, the other, one of the other neurotransmitters I talked about, in fact, when I pointed out acetylcholine, I said that's the transmitter that's best known for its, its activity in, in neurons talking to muscles. Okay. Acetylcholine is also a very important transmitter that's found in some areas of the brain. In fact, it's called the basal forebrain that actually feeds into the hippocampus. And in biochemical studies, on autopsy samples from Alzheimer's, one of the first biochemical changes that was noted was acetylcholine levels were decreased. So that would mean also less signaling got to the hippocampus. So it would explain some of the cognitive deficits. And in addition, acetylcholine signaling would be compromised. And so the thought was, if we can use drugs that boost acetylcholine, we might be able to at least keep, get a little more bang for our buck for the acetylcholine neurons that are there. Now what's kind of <clears throat> ironic is the drugs that we know that overactivate the acetylcholine system are pesticides and nerve gases. That's why they're toxic, because you get way too much of it, so acetylcholine goes crazy. And you fall down on the ground and have a seizure and die from respiratory failure. But if you give weak inhibitors, you can boost the activity of acetylcholine. And, and those drugs are still being used. The question, and, and I don't, I mean, I'm not sure many people know the answer to it, if anyone does, is whether or not that loss of acetylcholine is causative in the Alzheimer's disease or it's a symptom. More likely, it's not responsible for why the cells are dying. It's just that those acetylcholine cells are the most vulnerable. So tacrin and those types of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors represent really our first line of trying to attack the disease by blocking the symptoms, slowing the process down. And I think over the next five or six years, most of the drugs that emerge are going to focus on slowing down the degeneration. That actually, in, in some diseases, that wouldn't be as effective as it is in Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's is an age-related disease. So if you can slow down the progress of Alzheimer's by three or four years, you have a very significant effect on those patients. You affect their quality of life. If they're, they stay out of a hospital type situation for two or three additional years, that's a huge benefit to their quality of life, to, to the families that are supporting them. And crudely, it also really lowers the cost of treatment for, the, for taking care of those patients. So there's everything to gain in, in a whole series of diseases that, that are age-related neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Because if you can just slow the progress, it's a great intermediary step. The key is going to be understanding what's really causing the neurodegeneration and designing therapies that, that attack that. In the back, go ahead. Yeah. I'm going to come back to something. Hi, thanks. I was wondering, Vrampamil is a calcium channel blocker, and uh, it treats heart problems. I've also heard that it has psychotropic effects. It'd be, be kind of a mood stabilizer. I'm not sure what it is. Is that linked to the calcium influx that you were talking about okay. with the glutamate? <clears throat> okay, you're, you're getting out of my area of expertise specifically, particularly as how it's being used for cardiovascular effects. But... There are six or seven, at least, different types of calcium channels. So calcium is a ubiquitous signaling molecule that plays a lot of very diverse and important roles. And if you remember back to Chris's lecture, he talks about people don't, or evolutionarily, machinery isn't reinvented. It's just restructured. So as calcium is used as a signaling molecule, cells develop multiple ways to regulate its activity. So 
verafamil doesn't have any effect on calcium going in through the NMDA receptor. But there's a series of, and, and neurons have multiple calcium channels, so there's multiple types of signals that can modulate calcium. Some of it can boost and, and work with the NMDA receptor. Some of it can work against it and counter its effects. So am I surprised there are psychomimetic effects associated with a, a drug that affects calcium levels? No, not at all. Okay. But I don't know the exact cross-reactivity or what types of channels that drug would be affecting on specific neuronal circuits that would affect, that would affect behavior. But, but it's not that surprising. But there are multiple, multiple ways calcium can be controlled. In fact, in addition to calcium coming in from the outside, there are actually stores inside the cell of calcium. And some signaling molecules release calcium from inside cells that, that then do the signaling from, from the inside out. When a brain cell is misfiring, what is, what is happening to the brain and how and why does an anticonvulsant or an anti-seizure medication Work? correct that? Okay. Yes. The, the best way to think, so a seizure is defined as, as really uncontrolled, hyper, so too much, synchronous activity. So the brain is ex essentially firing uncontrollably. Whether or not a neuron fires is dependent upon the amount of glutamate excitatory signaling that it's getting and the amount of inhibitory signaling it's getting. Okay. So that balance <clears throat> between inhibition and, and excitation is very carefully maintained. In epilepsy, or really most things that could cause a seizure, something has happened that throws that balance off so that there's more excitatory activity. It could be something wrong with the glutamate system so it's more sensitive, or it could be something wrong with the GABA system such that it's less effective. But the overall balance between the two, somehow that regulation has been lost. Okay? So if I inject an NMDA agonist, so it's an excitatory receptor, and I put in not enough to kill the neuron, but I put in just a little less than that, I'll give the animal seizures. Okay? But I can also create seizures by going in and blocking the GABA system that's inhibitory. And, that, and so now there's the amount of excitation is normal, but it doesn't have the inhibitory activity controlling it. So now you have too much excitation as a result of this loss, and the cells will go into a seizure again. So I would, it's, it's pretty clear now that when you look at a disease like epilepsy, it's being called epilepsy based on the symptoms that you see, the seizures. What epilepsy is slowly being defined, divided into are a whole bunch of different types of disease where, where one specific change has occurred. The end result is the same. You have too much excitatory activity, but a number of different things might change. Okay. The anti-seizure drugs, Again, the first line of defense has been to try and just stop the seizure. So that can be done most effectively by boosting the amount of inhibition you have. So, so drugs like phenobarbital okay, um, will give the brain more inhibitory activity and counter too much excitation. Okay. But you can do the same thing with glutamate blockers. You can stop seizures. The problem with the glutamate blockers that I've just talked about is those will also really mess up a lot of higher cognitive functions. So right now, most of the best lines of defense on seizures are being used, are, are boosting inhibition. But again, the goal is to try and elucidate the underlying cause. And it's going to vary among patient groups and then tailor a therapy specifically based on their pathology. But it's taken us many, many years to get to the point where we understand even what all the players are. So we're just now situated and have enough of an understanding to where we can start to tease it apart. And, and quite often, we tease it apart with different types of animal models where we'll go in and selectively you know, perturb or damage one component of the system and say, OK, does that produce a seizure? What if I change it? Can, can I develop a therapy that would compensate for that? Does that make sense?
Oh, yeah. And you also have to remember, and this is the problem with virtually all CNS drugs. Okay, first of all, having a drug that will protect a seizure, having a drug that can affect behavior and treat schizophrenia, treat depression, it's amazing we even have those drugs. I mean, the, the analogy I've been told, it's like having a TV set that doesn't work properly and you shoot a bullet through it and it fixes it. I mean, it's, it's really amazing, okay? The fact that we've come as far as we can. But the problem, the hardest obstacle overcome is usually when there's a problem in the brain, it's in a very specific anatomical region. There's an imbalance, but there's an imbalance only in certain types of cells in a particular area. And when you treat the brain, right now we treat the whole brain. So we correct an imbalance here, and we create another imbalance over here, which is why CNS drugs are so fraught with side effects. So the goal is to try and identify what is the most specific thing that can be tied to the abnormality, and then can we design a therapeutic to go after just that specific abnormality. Go ahead. Does diet have anything to do with the way the brain functions, or is it kind of a closed system? And it doesn't no. Like so um, <laughs> diet has a lot to do with it. Now, one of the questions I, I typically get asked is, is, okay, glutamate, is that the same glutamate that monosodium glutamate is? Yes, it is. Okay. Does monosodium glutamate cause headaches? Probably not. In fact, very little dietary glutamate gets into the brain. The brain actually makes more glutamate than it uses and it pumps it out. Okay. So, so monosodium glutamate may be having effects in the periphery, maybe vasoconstriction, and that could cause headaches. But, but it, dietary glutamate is not screwing with this system here. But in a more general sense, nutrition and exercise have everything to do with brain function. I mean, and, and not only originally, so the Alzheimer's group I was working in, they started to identify super performers. So these were people that were in their 80s and 90s who had cognitive abilities comparable to people in their 30s and 40s. We started studying them as a group because, hey, you know, what are they doing right? Probably the, the first thing that became really obvious is those are all people that stayed mentally active. In fact, I still think the only thing that, that epidemiologically correlates with delaying the onset of Alzheimer's disease is education. And it's not that going to school prevented the disease. It's that the people that go, that go to school and went to college stay, generally tend to stay mentally active. Okay? And so they come to lectures like this. I mean, and, and the brain is no different than any other muscle. You use it okay, or you'll lose it. Okay? But even more evidence now suggests that just general exercise is unbelievably important for proper brain function. And whether or not that has to do with oxygen delivery, blood delivery, but um, a lot of these synaptic connections are changing with exercise. You can change the size and the volume of the hippocampus with aerobic exercise. I mean, those, those connections are just, people are just scratching the surface because at one time, I mean, trying to understand how the brain works, if, if you were to write a grant to the NIH saying, well, I want to run rats in a treadmill and then look at their brains, they, it wouldn't have a chance. But now we appreciate enough of what controls those connections and those higher types of function that hormones, uh, blood levels of nutrients, iron levels, those are all going to be effective. And so, you know, the single most important advice that in all these years of studying neuroscience is to just stay mentally active and stay physically active is probably the best thing you can do. Keep coming to lectures like this. <laughs> yes? First of all, I want to thank you and your students and your colleagues for doing this. Um, basic science research. It's very exciting to know that it's happening here at the university, and thank you for devoting your life to it. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, a couple of weeks ago at City Club Missoula, uh, Joe Fange from the yep. Office of uh, Technology Transfer uh, spoke, and he talked about research that's going on that um, is investigating using methamphetamines Right. as treatment for stroke. Can you talk about that or without going too far into the weeds? Sure. So it's another great example of basic research leading to someplace really cool. So that work was done by David Polson, who's a professor in our department. And he is interested in studying the ways in which neurons die and neurons can be protected. 
We have another research group on, in our department that is interested in toxicology, and particularly toxicology of agents that are inhaled, so respiratory type of toxicology. That's Andre Holian Center and a large number of investigators that work with him. One of the things they're investigating are what are the secondary toxic um, consequences of being in an area close to where there's a meth lab if you were to breathe in this meth. So they were trying to demonstrate the potential toxicology of methamphetamine. So they set up a collaborative work with, with Dave. And Dave was looking at um, stroke models, where he would stroke an animal, look at neurodegeneration. And what he was going to show is that if I give an animal methamphetamine, they're even more vulnerable to a stroke. It makes sense. We combine two bad things. They may have a synergistic effect. And when he treated the um, animal with the levels of methamphetamine that a person that's abusing the drug would use, it just blew apart the brain. I mean, massive, massive damage that was hard to even put on a microscope slide to, to characterize the damage. Being a good scientist, OK, let's do the control experiment. Let's keep lowering that methamphetamine concentration down to where it doesn't have an effect. And as he went lower and lower and lower and lower at the lowest concentrations, it did not have an effect. It actually reversed and protected against the neurodegeneration. So the methamphetamine is working kind of like NMDA, and it's working as an agonist at a number of different systems to boost function. And boosting that function, he's still trying to figure out exactly what's happening. Okay? But it seems to be beneficial. And it seems to be beneficial in traumatic brain injury as well, which is very similar. So now we're trying to study what is the mechanism by which methamphetamine might be working at these very low doses, even below the doses that would be used clinically. And methamphetamine is, is, an, is a regular FDA-approved drug for treating things like attention deficit disorder. The levels he was using was, were even lower than that. Okay? So, so that's where that project now rests. Now, the other thing that's really cool that people should be aware about, and Joe Fungi is a, is a great example, um, there is the potential for these discoveries to also have a commercial and an economic impact in Montana. So when we discover something, um, a number of years ago, the NIH and the federal government decided that we want to get those discoveries out to the people where they can be used. And the only way to do that is to protect it as intellectual property, to be able to patent it, and to be able to commercialize it. Well, who's going to do it? Okay. And they ceded the rights to patent it to the university where the research was being done. Okay. And this university, over the last several years, has been very proactive in trying to develop and protect an intellectual property. So the patents that, that come out are owned by the university. And if they generate royalties, that comes back to support the university and to support the research effort. In fact, the University of Montana's policy is so good okay, in how to share those revenues with the, with the inventors that we've recruited a number of people who are interested in doing these types of things only because we have a very proactive um, policy here on campus. And in fact, in the last four years, we've spun four companies out of the School of Pharmacy, biotech companies. Um, they're still all small. They're still all bootstrapping. Um, but they're employing students. Um, they allow our best students to stay here in Montana. Um, they are entrepreneurial. They're very high paying jobs in the biotech industry. They're very clean. And they play to the strengths that Missoula has with both really great clinical hospital care and the great academic environment. So, so those are efforts we have, to, we have to continue. It's one of the ways that the university can serve as a resource for the state beyond just what we do in education. Hi. I was wondering if you could, uh, hi, Rich. Oh, there you are. Um, I was wondering um, if you could talk about multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease and if any of that's being researched in your labs as well. OK. Um, so. Multiple sclerosis is another, I mean, it's a, it, it's a disease that, um, if you remember that slide that I showed of that long axon, so in MS, something is going wrong that is leading to damaging to the myelin that wraps around the axon. That myelin, the best way to think of it is like insulation on a wire. And in the disease, it's being scraped away. So the signaling is not efficient. Now, there are a number of different models 
as to how that's occurring. But it looks, I mean, in most cases, it may be an autoimmune disease where essentially the, what would be the white blood cells, the macrophages in the brain, somehow recognize or identify that myelin as abnormal and they start degrading it. Okay. And what's, again, it's a tragic disease, but very interesting from a neurological perspective in neurochemistry is the symptoms show up for wherever those axons are damaged on that particular circuit. So if, if the axons that control vision are damaged, okay, you'll start having blurred vision. And then it seems to heal itself and the symptoms go away and then you might have weakness in an arm and that means that degeneration of that myelin is occurring on the axons that control the movement of your arm. Unfortunately, it keeps progressing so each of these sort of attacks, the damage to the white matter becomes cumulative and it becomes progressive. Right now there's no one in, in our group on campus that's focused in on, on MS. I'm not sure if there are any clinical trials for MS taking place at the Neuroscience Institute um, at, at the hospital. And I know there are clinicians that are very interested in that and are very, you know, are, are very good at treating it. But that's just not one of the areas that, that we have gone into as far as our research focus area here. More questions? How are we right. doing? Well, thank you very much for okay. coming. and. It's really slippery outside, so be careful yeah. driving home. Very slick. Thank you, everybody. Come back next time. <laughs>